Good day, everyone. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, the issue or the subject of money and currency during the Second World War in the Philippines during the Japanese occupation. So I've titled my presentation, Resisting Mickey Mouse, Philippine Emergency and Guerrilla Currency During World War II. So first of all, we are probably familiar with Mickey Mouse money. Uh, it is the common term that is given to the Japanese invasion money or the Japanese military script or the Japanese money that was brought here. Uh, these were currency, these were bills that were printed by Japan even before the war. And as early as March or April 1941, now the war started in December, the Japanese Ministry of Finance was already giving e orders to print money for the areas that they were in planning to invade. Uh, the Philippines was just one of many. So they printed Mickey Mouse money for what was then Malaya, British Malaya, Netherlands East Indies, even Oceania. So there are different, e even Burma. So they had different types of uh, this so-called, what we would call Mickey Mouse money. The common thing with all of this was that the first issue had something that was common to a particular country. In the Philippine case, it was abaca. So many people think that it's, uh, this, is bana this is coconut or whatever, or, or fibers, but it's abaca because that was grown by the Japanese in Davao. In the case of Malaya, for example, they had bananas and they had fruits. So if we call the Japanese money here Mickey Mouse money, in Malaya it's called banana money. It also became worthless in the end. So it was called Mickey Mouse money most probably because it did not look real. The first issues of this Japanese money did not have serial numbers. The second issue had looked more like money. It had serial numbers. It had the statue of, it had the monument of Jose Rizal. But as the war went on, the value of this money dropped very, very significantly. By the end of the war, nobody was accepting the money anymore, which is why Mickey Mouse, who was a fictitious character, is probably why it became known as Mickey Mouse money. Other people called it gurami. And gurami is a small kind of fish that there are thousands of. So the first issue was something that really looked like play money. This was printed in Japan. It came with the Japanese invasion forces and they began to buy things with it right away. But people did not want to accept it because it had no serial numbers. It had no guarantee of payment. The pre-war money that we had and following the Americans' money would always say you can redeem this in the bank for silver content and so forth. The Mickey Mouse money did not have any of that. All it said, Japanese government, one peso, five pesos, five centavos, and so forth. Now, by late 1942, they came out with a second edition, or a second issue, which was issued by a Japanese bank, the so-called Southern Development Bank. And this one was the one that had serial numbers already. By the late part of the war, the serial numbers were used up. So there were what were called replacement issues, which, were, which started with a number one and that uh, the numbers got longer. And by 1944, as the money became worthless, uh, before the war, the biggest bill we had was 20 pesos. A 20 peso bill could buy a lot of money, um, a lot of things. We even had the kusing, or the half centavo before the war. So 20 pesos was a big amount of money. The biggest bill we had was 20 pesos. If you said you had 100 pesos, mayaman ka na. So during the Japanese time, they issued money for five centavos, one centavo, and all the way up to 20 pesos. By the middle of the war, 20 pesos was almost useless. So they came out with a 50 peso bill. Then they came out with a 100 peso bill. And then they came out with a 500 peso bill. And at the end of the war, they had, 1, 000, they had a 1,000 peso bill. Nobody in the pre-war society ever imagined we could have a 1,000 peso bill because you were counting centavos. So that's how deflated the money was by the end of the war. So there was se severe inflation. Nobody wanted to accept it. And it was relatively easy to forge. In fact, within one month of the Japanese occupation in Manila, there were reports already that there were forgeries, and the Japanese were banning people from using these forgeries. The Americans were able to capture some of this. So the first part of the resisting Mickey Mouse, we would say the Americans would have done some of it because the guerrillas here were able to send some of the samples of the money to Australia. 
and they studied it, and they found out that the paper that was used for Mickey Mouse money was actually made in the States, and that they found out they had large stocks of that particular paper in the States, and so they were able to reproduce in very great detail this Mickey Mouse money. So this was counterfeit Mickey Mouse money, which you can tell uh, in some ways is very difficult to tell. You need a very detailed analysis. Some of the curls were different, and some, some of the colors were different. And of course, if they were newly made, they would look very mint. They would look fresh from the, from the uh, printer. So what they did in Australia, before they sent it over to the guerrillas here, was they put it in washing machines and turn it around. So by the time it got here, mukhang gamit na, it was already worn, and that could pass. It was very difficult to detect, even today. It's very hard to detect these fake Mickey Mouse bills. Of course, the guerrillas made some of it also. So uh, these are some examples. This is the, the one on top with the PD is the first issue. The P stood for Philippines. The D was supposed to represent the area in which it circulated. The one that you see below, the five peso bill, was the one that came out in 1942 later on with the serial number and the statue of Jose Rizal. So there were other forms also. And then, so the 500 peso bill that we see is here, is, that was inflation, very severe inflation. But what's interesting also is that during the Laurel presidency, during the so-called Second Republic, the Second Republic knew that one sign of sovereignty was control over money. And if the Japanese controlled the money, all the Mickey Mouse money, then that made independence useless. So the Laurel government wanted to take in all of that Mickey Mouse money and issue their own money, which was by the newly created Banco Central ng Pilipinas. That was something that was first created during the Laurel regime. So the other money that we see here is unique because it says Banco Central ng Pilipinas, and it's all in Tagalog, or it's all in Filipino. The money that was used before was all in English. So the Banco Central notes, they were never actually circulated. They were printed in Japan, but the Japanese did not want to lose control of the currency, so they did not. The only thing we have actually are specimens of that particular note. But it was one way of Laurel saying, I want financial autonomy. And uh, if the war had lasted longer, maybe we would, we would have gotten to use it. So. One form of countering the Japanese was to put slogans behind them and try to show how useless the money was. So this is an example, the five peso bill that was captured by Americans or guerrillas, and they stamped in the back the prosperity sphere, what is it worth? Because by that time it was useless. And so the Japanese were talking about prosperity sphere, we are brothers and all of this. So to print this on the money, was really to say the corporate prosperity sphere is totally useless. It has no value whatsoever, just like this bill. So that was one way of sub sabotaging the Mickey Mouse money, actually. And aside from this, there would be other bills that also came out. So one wonders when the first use of Mickey Mouse was actually, when it actually came out. Today, we take it for granted. Everyone says Mickey Mouse but money. But I went looking for the earliest times that it was printed. And this is, I think, the earliest one I found, March 2, 1945. It says Mickey Mouse money, Mickey Mouse currency will not be redeemed. It is totally useless. It was probably in vogue even before this. To see it in print in 1945 already means that it was common knowledge that uh, people were calling it Mickey Mouse money. But aside from that, and one way of challenging this Japanese control of the currency was what we'd call emergency currency. And so emergency currency was something that was issued because it was needed. When the war started, all of the money that the provinces were using came from Manila. Most of this was actually printed in the US and it came to the Philippines. And it was stored, stored in Manila. And then it was distributed to Aklan, <coughs> Papsambuanga, and elsewhere in the Philippines. But when the war started, the shipping ships were no longer able to move from Manila to Cebu to Mindanao. There was no more transportation. So places that were relying on money from Manila suddenly found themselves short of currency. So this is why we have this emergency currency that came around. 
because Cebu, for example, had to play, pay its government employees. And how could you pay them if no money was coming in? You could not give them IOU or utang muna. You had to give them something that looked like real paper. And that was authorized by the government. So President Quezon was in Corregidor at this time. And Quezon gave authority to the different provincial currency boards. He made sure that each province basically had a currency board. And those that did not would have money coming from those that did. So the big provinces that had big currency boards and that came up with this emergency currency would have been Cebu, would have been Iloilo, would have been Negros, I think Bacolod, and Lanao in Mindanao or Misamis, Misamis Occidental. All of these were big hubs for this emergency currency to be issued. Since there was a war going on, people had to be paid. And Mickey Mouse money, people didn't want to accept the Mickey Mouse money. Before, and these are places that the Japanese had not yet reached. So there was no money coming from Manila, and the people needed to be paid. There was a war going on, so there were military contractors, there were bus drivers, soldiers had to be paid. To make things even more compli complicated, before the end of 1941, when December 1941, Quezon issued a decree stating that all government officials would be paid a three-month advance salary. That would help them tide over the difficulty. So uh, if you were receiving one month, you would get three times that in one big bonus. And you needed money for that. So the emergency currency filled that. And this was all authorized before the fall of Bataan. So Quezon was still in Corregidor and it was for payment for salaries and so forth. And it's interesting to look into how these were designed, how they were printed. In many cases, the provinces or Iloilo and Cebu, they had big printing presses, so they were able to make this. In the case of Cebu, the person who actually designed the Cebu bills, was a, he was a, an artist by himself. And so he was designing, he knew how to design bills so that they would look like money. So his grandson, I think, is still in Cebu. They operate a butterfly haven in Cebu City. And uh, it's a very interesting story about how they designed the bills so that they would look real. And they had, of course, they all had serial numbers. They all said this is authorized by the government. This is temporary for the emergency. But when the war ends, you can redeem it. You can go to the banks and the banks will pay you genuine money. For areas that did not, were not able to print their own money, they would rely on, let's say, Cebu. Leyte could not print its own money, so Cebu would have some of its money stamped for distribution in Leyte, in Tacloban, and so forth. So if you look at this, one of the most common bills is really ones from Cebu, Iloilo, and Negros. And sometimes they have stamps behind them telling you where they were authorized to circulate. So since this challenged the Japanese directly, because if you were working on the eco economy using these emergency bills, the Mickey Mouse money would really look like play money. So the Japanese decided to issue a decree saying that this is illegal, but since so many people were using it in the Visayas and Mindanao, then what the Japanese did was, you turn it to us, we will replace it with Mickey Mouse money. So they tried to replace it with their own money. But some of it was never redeemed, some of it was actually stolen, in the case of Lanao, there's a case where there was a warehouse of that and some, some uh, looters managed to get it. So that had to be demonetized very quickly. So today for collectors, if you look at the serial number, you'll know if it was the part of the demonetized hoard or not. So that was for the emergency currency. And then let's go to the next one. So this is one of the earliest ones. And this is emergency currency. Usually it would have the date. Uh, when it was issued, by what authority, there's a serial number. This is in the mountain province. So you see, even in the mountain province, they, were, they needed money. And again, the story of how these were printed, some of them were mimeographed, some of them used printing presses. The use of color was very important because you had to make the money look like real money. Uh, those that were mimeographed were simply black, black and white. So this, this one in particular, you see the serial number is a different color. The color of the bill itself is quite different. 
they had to have signatures. In fact, some of them have real signatures. So you imagine that the provincial board would sit down and sign all of those bills, and if they're signing thousands of bills, and it had to be in a certain format that you have certain serial numbers, block of serial numbers would be signed by this particular person. So if you knew, if you had a bill that had a serial number and someone else signed it, you knew it was a forgery, it was a fake. So this is Manila, that, and then this one is from Cagayan. What is interesting about the Cagayan note is to make it look even more real, because this was, the, the Cagayan note was only mimeographed. Mimeograph was uh, using just mimeographing paper. But you see the very clear sign, two pesos, show that this is uh, real money. And to make people believe that it was more real, they actually put a, uh, they put a, a custom stamp on it. So that meant that it was really, this is real money. It will be redeemed later on. And what's also interesting about this particular bill is it was signed by the governor of Free Cagayan, Marcelo Aduru. So Marcelo Aduru was one of the first guerrilla leaders in Northern Luzon. And so if you look at this bill, it's, it's really very, it, it tells a very important story. The, the governor himself signed it. It has that stamp to show it's genuine, and then it's two pesos. So this other one is, uh, this is in Bohol. Now in Bohol, they had several, this was, I think this used the regular printing press, but uh, what you see here again is a mixture of actual signatures. So again, depending on the, depending on the uh, serial number, you have a number of signatures, and these are actually real signatures. So each bill had to be signed in person. But this is part of the emergency bills that we're talking about. Uh, this is another curious one. Uh, this one is in Ilocos Norte. So this one is, uh, this is mimeographed again, but this time they did not put a, a seal on it. What some of these bills did was they folded them into two. They were a piece of paper folded into two. And in the middle, they would put threads of different colors. So that this, if you wanted to make sure it was real, you opened it up and you'd see the different threads, ah, this is real. This is an important bill also because the one who signed this is Roque B. Ablan. Now, Roque B. Ablan was the guerrilla governor of Ilocos Norte. If you have Aduru in Cagayan, you have, uh, you have Ablan in Ilocos Norte. Ablan was never found. He, was, uh, he remained governor of free Ilocos Norte until the Japanese hunted him down. They surprised him and he disappeared and he's never been found. So he's one of those missing in action. So when you, can, when you can identify the people who actually signed these bills, it makes the bills speak out a little more. Okay, apart from the emergency currency, you know, the emergency currency was essentially issued before the fall of Bataan and Corregidor. So the government was still in existence in the Philippines. But once Bataan and Corregidor fell, that placed the Philippines under Japanese control. And so you now have guerrilla resistance movements moving out. No longer did they have contact with Quezon because Quezon was now in the United States. So we can say that this guerrilla currency was now the currency of a free people because now it was the people themselves who were making this currency. They were issued by various guerrilla organizations or civil governments in what was called free areas. In the case of Panay Island, for example, there was a military government, but there also was a civil government. In Negros Occidental, there was, a military gov there was a military structure, there was a guerrilla structure, but they also had a guerrilla, uh, they had a civil government as well. So those were called the free areas. And there were provincial and municipal and even island issues. So what is interesting in this case is some of them were authorized by the Commonwealth government. Some of them managed to establish radio contact with Quezon in Washington, D.C., or through Australia. And they were actually given permission, you print only this much amount of money, very specific, one peso, 1,000 bills, two pesos, so many thousand. So all of this was tracked, you could track all of them down. Others, however, were not authorized. So guerrillas needed money to operate, and sometimes they could not get in touch with the Commonwealth government, so they had to print their own money regardless. And what is interesting about most of these guerrilla currency is that they are used. These were not mint things that were 
fresh from the press or they were kept in people's homes, they were actually used. If you look at many of the bills, they're even torn, they're, uh, they're bent. Uh, so they were actually used in the guerrilla areas. So some of these uh, here is, uh, usually, they were used, usually they were small denominations, centavos, even one centavo, 10 centavos. But this is one of the bigger uh, examples. This is 100 pesos, and this is in Iloilo. So sometimes they were getting that big also, particularly if the military needed to buy large numbers of uh, equipment or food or things like that. But again, you have the date here, and we know that this is guerrilla money now because it's December 1942. So Bataan has fallen, Corredor has fallen, Quezon is in Washington. So this is now guerrilla money, although it also sometimes says uh, emergency currency. But apart from this, the other provinces also had their currency. Imagine that you would have as far down south as Zamboanga, even in Holo, they were printing money like this. And again, the system, it's very crude money. This was probably mimeographed. You can imagine them doing this in the jungle, in the mountains, with a mimeographing press and, this, and, the, and, this, and the molds, the, the, the forms for that. So there's a story behind all of this, all of this money. This one is interesting because this is from, this is the one from Balangiga. I think this is Balangiga. So if you remember Philippine history, one of the big events that took place during the Phil American War was the so-called massacre at Balangiga, in which case the American, the American garrison was killed by Filipino freedom fighters. And after that, they declared some are no man's land and they killed everyone they could. So it started with Balangiga. But during the war, you have this money that was even be being issued in Balangiga to show that they were not anti-American anymore, that they were fighting on the side of the Americans too. Very crudely done again, uh, but uh, this shows that, again, it, this is very much used, it's very worn, so it's, uh, it shows that it was actually handed from person to person. And then this is a higher denomination note. Uh, this was issued in northern Luzon, in Ilocos Sur or so, by the guerrilla group of Walter Cushing. It's very well printed, so they probably had access to a press. They had good paper. And again, the story of the presses used, some of them had good presses. Some of them were using wood block prints. Some of them were handmade. So it's a very interesting comparison to sh show how, again, this was the currency of a free people. And the, for design and production, there's stories about all of them, who were designing them to make them like real, look like real bills. What were they using? Wood block prints. It's relatively easy to see. This is made by a wood block print. So someone carved it and they stamped it on the paper. The mimeograph was very often used. We don't use that anymore today, but it was the form of mass reproduction in the olden days. Some places actually had small presses and they, did, they used that manually. And since some of these were easy to copy, they were also counterfeit guerrilla notes. But since the guerrillas were very uh, strict on how the, guerrillas were, how the guerrillas used their money, it's now actually harder to find these counterfeits because the guerrillas punished anyone that was found with a counterfeit note. So today, uh, finding a counterfeit note is sometimes a, a treasure. It's more expensive than the real bill because it was really banned. And so we mentioned the security features, the serial numbers, the counter signs, the colored threads in the middle. And they used all kinds of paper. They used uh, coupon bond. They used manila paper. They even used paper bags. What they had to use were paper that, was, that could stand being passed from person to person. So if you, you were using thin paper, onion skin, that would not last. So there was one group of people who in Aklan were actually using cardboard as uh, paper money. And so we can look at these uh, people who are making the guerrilla currency as heroes in themselves, acquiring paper and ink, printing, the, finding the printing equipment, transferring the location from one place to another, hiding in the mountains, printing this. The Japanese tried to stop the printing many times, they tried to look for where the print where the presses were, they tried to capture them. So the presses had to move from place to place. And 
sometimes if they were lucky, a submarine would come from Australia bringing more paper, more ink, and even presses. So the money that we find in Mindanao is usually of very good quality because a press managed to reach Mindanao with paper and ink, so the quality is very good. But again, the counterfeits, sometimes they're easy to detect. And in fact, I've included an example here that will show you what they count. This is genuine. This is from the Mindanao Currency Board. So this was printed by a press that a submarine brought in. They brought in the ink, they brought in the paper. Very good quality. This, is, uh, this shows you how people had to make do with paper. If you did not have enough paper, you used government forms. So the front part is, uh, looks like money, but the back part is a government appropriation form that they used to print the money on. I think this was in Zamboanga or it's in Samar. And after that, this is one interesting bill. This is in Negros, and it shows that it came from a paper bag because you see the jagged edge on one side. That was the top of the paper bag that they were using for to print the money. Uh, usually, they would also put in colorful designs. Here you have the face of Quezon, the face of, the face of uh, Roosevelt. Sometimes you'd have heroes and so forth. So very imaginative how they tried to make the money look like real money. And then you'd have stamps and seals. As I mentioned to you, had all that series of personal uh, uh, autographs or signatures. So again, it had to match with the, it had to match with the serial number. If it did not match with the signal, if it did not match with the serial number, fake yet. So again, can you imagine that this has three people signing or four people, and how many would they have to sign? So buong hapon siguro na to sign sila, and uh, this was just one of those again mountain province. So it means that bundok sila, and they are they need money. So after this, this one I sh I chose because it uses a particular s illustration that showed that they were optimistic that they would win. The prominent V in the center of this note is a symbol for victory. So every time you showed the V for victory sign, and any time you put V anywhere else, that meant victory for the Allies, for the Americans, taloing Japon eventually. So this is an interesting note. This is from, uh, this is from Panay, because in Panay there was a government, uh, there was a uh, military government, and there also was a civil government. So they were actually rivals. The military government said it's martial law, so we have all the authority. But the civil government, it was a governor confessor who was there at the time, said no, it's still civilian authority over the military. So the military side under Colonel Peralta issued their own currency, but on confessor's side, he issued his own currency. And this is an example of the uh, civil government in Panay currency that was issued by the treasurer, Grinio. So these are called Grinio bills. And that was declared invalid by the Peralta side because it's martial law. We're under martial law, we cannot have rival money like this. So these are very hard to find actually because the military would say you cannot use this. So this, this is a rather difficult bill to find. This is an example of counterfeits. So even though there were these uh, counterfeit or the, the security provisions, there were counterfeits that were being made. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's harder to find the counterfeit because if you were found with counterfeit, you were jailed, you were tortured, or even you were killed. So this is an example of a counterfeit. The one on top is real. This is that 100 peso bill showing Mount Mayon. And you'll notice the, you can tell it's real because the drape that you see on top is draped over the bar. The counterfeit has the bar running through the drape. So if, you're, if you look at the bills and you see one like that, this is counterfeit. Others, uh, I, showed illustrations of, uh, I showed illustrations of Roosevelt and illustrations of Quezon. Sometimes the counterfeit illustrations were not that good, so you could tell, ah, this is fake, this is fake, very crude you know, illustration. But sometimes, in some cases, the illustrations were even better than the original. So if they became so nice, ah, this is counterfeit also. So it's, it's a whole interesting subject on detecting these counterfeits themselves. So we round, up, we round this up now by going into what happened to all of this after the war. So all of them 
were, if they were legitimate, if they were genuine, the banks were supposed to take them in after the war and issue real money after the war. So many of the bills were actually redeemed in banks, but many more were not because I think there was a limit and I think many were not able to reach the banks in time. So a large number were redeemed, but even more, I think, were not redeemed. And those that were not authorized by Quezon or those that were not authorized by the Commonwealth government were, of course, never redeemed. So uh, the earlier bill that I showed, Walter Cushing, that guerrilla unit was never officially recognized, although Walter Cushing was real, he was executed by the Japanese, but the government refused to recognize that. And so that was one group of currency that was not recognized. Now, long after the war now, uh, these bills have become collector's items. There are collectors who really are very, very serious about them. They follow the serial numbers. They look very well for, they look uh, very well for the forgeries, for the counterfeit bills. And uh, some of them can really re reach very large amounts of money. If you go to eBay, for example, and you try to see how much a bill from Samar costs, it can easily go to $100 or $150. And I think as Samar is one of the rare bills anywhere from the towns of Samar. Zamboanga is rare. Uh, Leyte, the bills from Leyte are also very rare, and usually they're in very bad shape. So collectors are very, very possessive about this. And some of them don't even want to show their collections because people might want to get them from them. So some of them are really worth a lot of money now, especially when you realize that some of them were only issued in, let's say, 500 issues or so forth. When you look at the serial numbers, you can actually see how many were issued. And because of that, the scarcity or the uh, plentifulness of a bill will determine its value today. But you look at what the prices are in eBay nowadays, and it's really amazing how expensive these things go and sometimes people really buy them and there are auctions in the Philippines and abroad where you really have these serious collectors and they really are after some of these very very rare bills some bills are very common but the others are very rare so it is an interesting thing to start a collection of this because the, each bill has its own story and even the Japanese money even the Mickey Mouse money has its own story if you know how to read through it. So with that, thank you very much and good day.